I'm not sure if I'm supposed to welcome you to First Baptist or not because the only two people here are Deb and I. So we're trying to put this together and hopefully this will work for the time being. Uh, we're not sure how much longer we'll be meeting in this way. We're hopeful that by Easter we can gather, but all that is uncertain, as you all know. And of course, by now you know this method or this means of communicating uh, via a recorded YouTube video is our best solution for now to uh, uh, give some semblance of unity to, to our fellowship. And we hope that you'll tune in and participate and those who uh, uh, may not be aware of this, maybe, maybe one or two of you can get together, I'm not sure. The, the meetings are not supposed to be any greater than 10 and even that seems to be suspect now. So just by way of uh, announcements here, you might want to take the bulletin, which Nana has sent. Thank you, Nana, for uploading and organizing all this as well. Um, notice that all the announcements in the bulletin are tentative, of course. Whether we would meet next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, is, of course, uncertain. If, in case we did, uh, we may end up having a prayer emphasis then and possibly even a choir rehearsal, that's unsure as well. Easter's the 12th, the next Sunday, and of course we normally have our Easter sunrise breakfast, whether that occurs, unsure as well. Uh, Deb has planned on April the 14th the ladies' prayer and share, so that continues to be in the bulletin, and, uh, and then from there on out the 19th the officers would meet, and if that's the case, uh, that date holds, we will physically meet, but otherwise I think officers will be meeting virtually on the internet as well. Uh, happy birthday to Caitlin and Alex Feliciano, Mark Minnick and Stephen Thompson, also birthdays this week. Quiet meditation scripture that we have uh, this for this time, which by the way, when we're recording it this way, we hope to have it recorded by uh, the supper time on Saturdays and upload those to the internet. You could probably access them Saturday evening or any time after that. If you're used to meeting or wanting to worship at the normal times on Sunday, of course, hopefully that will be available to you. Meditation scripture. For today, March the 29th, is Psalm 79, 8 and 9. Do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. Let your compassion come quickly to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake.
Well, normally you'd be turning in your hymn books right now to hymn number 370, but instead we've uh, printed off, and you should have had that sent to you. Nana has sent that. Uh, along with the bulletin. So if you pull that out, we're going to sing together an appropriate hymn that's familiar to us all, Count Your Blessings. up the verses so the chorus I will sing of the mercies of the Lord you have that in your bulletins I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing 
reading this morning or this evening or this afternoon, whichever, we're going to continue what we have been reading in 2 Samuel. We're going to begin today at 2 Samuel chapter 3. You might want to take your Bibles and follow along. I'm going to read from the new, or rather the New King James Version. 2 Samuel 3, 1 to 18. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, his second Chiliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, the third Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Gesher, the fourth, Abinijah, the son of Haggith, the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrium, by David's wife, Eglah. These were born to David in Hebron. Now it was... So, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ahah. So Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth. And said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today, today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman? May God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David saying, whose is the land? Saying also, make your covenant with me and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David said, good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring uh, Michal, rather, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David said, sent rather messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from uh, Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Bahurim, weeping behind her. So Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. Now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, in time past you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, 
I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Dear kind and loving Heavenly Father, as we read this text and see how you protected David and wrote and, and uh, brought him up into the ultimate uh, king and ruler of this nation, your sovereignty is obvious. And those in this story today, in this record, indicate that they did understand it was from your mouth that this was to occur. And we see everything about us today as sovereignly incurring. The virus, the trouble that's all around us, the political up upheavals in our own country. We know that you're in control. And for those who love you, the comfort is that we know that you hold the future in your hand and you'll do all the things of which are yet to come to pass for your glory and for the good of your people. We thank you, Lord, for reaching into our hearts and our minds and drawing us to yourself, not of any merit of our own, but all by your wonderful grace and mercy. Thank you for the fellowship of people that we have here, even though we can't physically meet here today. We pray for each, Lord, that you would encourage them. May this video of a, a service, Lord, encourage and help unite us uh, in this common exercise and function of obedience as we would gather every Sunday. May it be an encouragement to each of us. We pray for those not simply who are not able to get out of their homes, that's most of us now, but those who are far from us, uh, we pray the Lord that you'll bring those yet away uh, back home, Patsy and Elaine, uh, you'll give them safety as they travel back here. Any who may be Ill, Ill, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you might in your kindness raise them to health and strength, that you might keep us safe from the virus, if that's your will as well. But we thank you even now for your purposes and what you intend to accomplish through it. And may uh, the words of this text today and above all the preaching of your word here, uh, may it honor you and encourage each of us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now we of course don't have an offertory as we normally would. Uh, but we do encourage you to uh, continue to support the fellowship and uh, you can mail those in if you'd like. Some of you, I think, have it just automatically debited from your bank account and that's all fine as well. But thank you for remembering uh, the fellowship. Turn in your hymn book, if you have one, to 517 or otherwise, you again have the music sent to you. It's an old hymn entitled On Jordan's Stormy Banks. Let's see this. Okay. 
Tim is written in your bulletin. It's entitled, What a Day That'll Be. I'm going to be giving you a lot of verses, a lot of texts here this morning, and I've taken the liberty of not continuing my study of 2 Thessalonians, but rather pick that up again when we return. So hopefully that'll happen soon, and, uh, and we can get back into that wonderful epistle that Paul wrote. Instead, I'm going to look somewhat topically here today at the question, or actually the issue of the virus and God's answers to this virus, the questions that are related. Let me begin by just reading some of the uh, verses of scripture, first of all, that I want you to think on. And I may be reading these a little fast, so I don't expect you to keep up but I'll try to give you some forewarning. Proverbs 27, verse 1, we read, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. In the book of James, verses 13 to 17, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're a vapor, just a vapor, that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. 
Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's sin. And then in Job 5, verse 7, we read, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. What do these verses have in common? Well, tribulation, yes. Trouble, uncertainty. And if I was a betting man, I bet we'd all been thinking trouble, tribulation, and uncertainty during this time. About now, we are all looking forward to that day when we can all have a sense of control, a sense of stability without the threat of calamity. The problem is we were never in control in the first place. James was right. We don't know what life will be like tomorrow. Now, certainly this virus has forced on all of us a reality we at times would rather not think about. Spiritually, the circumstances force to the top questions that may be uncomfortable, even disturbing. Is God involved in this disease? What possible purpose could he have in this, this tragedy? And what should be our response? You can follow the outline that's been uploaded along with the bulletin. First of all, is God involved in this pandemic? Now again, let me read for you some scripture that quite compellingly answers yes to the question. Ephesians 1.11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Lamentations 3, 37 and 38. Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Ecclesiastes 7.14 When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. And of course, the question settled by a mere cursory reading of Job. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves from the, uh, before the Lord, and Satan also came along with them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the face of the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless, an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a message to Job, a messenger to Job, and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. 
And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now it becomes clear that Satan was not in control over what he wanted to do to Job, but God was. In fact, Satan could do nothing to Job apart from God permitting it. This meant that not only the natural disasters described in verses 16 and 21, but even the human terrorist attacks in verses 15 and 17 could not be carried out without God's permission. And I think most would label this virus as natural. Centuries ago, Augustine said, nothing therefore happens unless the omnipotent wills it to happen. He either permits it to happen or he brings it about himself. We ironically find ourselves in a similar situation to those who lived in the 17th century when the plague, known as the Black Plague or the Bubonic Plague, visited Rome and reoccurred for many years. It's apparent to me that COVID-19 does not fall outside God's purposes and control because simply nothing does. So secondly, the next question is, what possible purpose could God have in this tragedy? To the Christian, there is an undeniable relationship between the reality of suffering and the reality of sin. Before the fall, there was no suffering and there be none in the new heavens and the earth. So the obvious connection and the ultimate cause was sin. Yet one's suffering does not necessarily have a direct connection to sin. For instance, there's the example of the man born blind from birth in John chapter 9. And it reads in the first three verses there, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. There is, of course, a reason for all suffering, but in this case, it wasn't sin, but rather that God would be glorified in his miraculous healing of this man born blind. And with Job, what was going on there? We and he only learn later that the trials resulted in Job's own repentance and humility when he rebuked and questioned God's justice. And willingness to pray for his friends that were less than understanding and comforting. On the other hand, suffering should always occasion an evaluation of my relationship with God. As with Job, it was a source of correction. And so also with the selfish taking of communion by the Corinthians, you recall, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The problem is, first, that we're asking the wrong question. What we so often do is ask, why does God allow suffering? And that's actually not the question we should be asking. Notice how Christ handles this relationship between sin and suffering in Luke chapter 13, the first five verses. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were sinners, were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Of those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now here, Christ is being informed and then questioned concerning the unfortunate fate of the Galileans whom were martyred by Pilate 
And then Jesus added to this the 18 who were killed by a tower that collapsed on them. Two groups of people that appeared to be minding their own business, hurting no one, not blaspheming God, and then pow, they're dead. The question posed to Christ was, were the Galileans greater sinners than everyone else? And Jesus poses the same question about the 18. Were they worse culprits than everyone else? The question strikes at the root cause of suffering or tragedy. Did they deserve this? If I clean up my act, will I dodge a similar fate? Will I avoid such tragedy and trouble? Well, so how does he answer them? Oh, my father was asleep. He was distracted and was looking the other way. He was busy counting hairs on your head or sparrows that fall. No. He first directly answers the question with a very clear no. I tell you no. And the immediate point, the, and then he immediately points out that they were asking the wrong question. They were focusing on the trivial, not the important. They were asking, why did God allow these innocent people to die? Not, why didn't that tower fall on me? Why not my blood? The point Christ appears to be making is that these events are intended to sober us all to the realities that await us. Suffering bewilders us because we've grown accustomed to God's mercy and being so long-suffering to us. Amazing grace is no longer amazing to us. So our astonishment is in the wrong place. Our question should be, why hasn't he destroyed us all since we got out of bed this morning? Why does God tolerate us sinful creatures? Next, consider this, that suffering is not unjust. What's real injustice? What about suffering that results from injustice? Yes, it's true that Christians and many other people suffer unjustly at the hands of others. And vindication is the cry of many poor in the Old Testament upon the cruelty of the rich or the sinfulness of, slave, of the slave's masters. And such injustice is no, no illusion. Yet the injustices that go on between people can never be turned vertical. That is, it's not fair, God. And why? Because that relationship is never unjust or unfair. Be simply reminded by the Apostle Paul's words in Romans chapter 9, 13 and 14. He said, just as it's written, Jacob... I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Or Paul says later in verses 18 to 21, so then he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, who answers back to God, well, what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of one the same lump that is one vessel for honorable use and the other for dishonorable use? R.C. Sproul weighs in on this text and he says, you can pray about whatever you want to pray about, but my friends, don't ask for justice from God because he might get it. You, accept, you in fact may get it. As believers, we must enthusiastically embrace the truth that there are no accidents. It's all part of God's sovereign plan. Paul says in Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. 
Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, 16 to 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. One might ask about particular cases of suffering and their purposes, like Job. And you may get no answer, just like him. He cried out for vindication, and God turned around and interrogated him for eight chapters with words like, who do you think you are? Where were you when I formed the heavens and the earth? Can you send a bird south in the winter or bind the stars in the sky? Chapter after chapter, Job answers no to God's question, who do you think you are interrogating me? And notice Job's last words of Job 42, the first six verses. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God was telling Job, there are some things that I choose not to reveal to you. Since when do I have to check in with you before I migrate birds or bind the stars in the sky or inflict pain or trouble into your life? Understand, though, the sin is not in the asking these questions, but the motive in the asking. That is, are you questioning God's wisdom or just, as Job apparently did? Are you questioning his wisdom or just, justice, or do you simply desire greater knowledge? Thirdly, notice what would be some of these revealed purposes. There is this nagging question, of course, why? Though we may be asking the wrong question, and we may realize God is always just in what he does, even in his afflictions, he does graciously give us some general purposes for the suffering that we can grasp. Again, remember, we were already told we'll suffer. Not that we might, but that we will. So what are the general whys? Let me give you nine. First, suffering is a vehicle to God's blessing if we suffer for Christ's sake. Again, that was 1 Peter chapter 2.18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Do not not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, even though we usually apply these verses to persecution in some, in some form, it certainly can apply even within the context of illness and physical maladies, which, as we saw, Job identified its source as coming from God, of whom he continued to call blessed. Secondly, suffering can be used to conform us to the image of Christ. And we learn that from that famous passage in Romans chapter 8, 28 and 29. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. It's intended by God to make us like himself. Thirdly, suffering can help us learn his word. The psalmist says in Psalm 119.71, it's good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statues. Some of our best learning is in the midst of trouble and trials. Fourthly, it may be used by God to break lifestyles. Psalm 119 verse 69 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Fifthly, it can install endurance. And James speaks of this in James 1, 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Sixthly, suffering can test the genuineness of our faith. And Peter speaks of this in the first chapter of his first epistle. Verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Seventh, it can be used, suffering, to restore and confirm and strengthen and establish us. Again, Peter says in 1 Peter 5.10, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then that famous passage in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7, God uses suffering to humble us. Paul said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored, implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What a list of trouble he gave. And that last one, number nine. God uses suffering to discipline only his children. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse five. And have you not forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when improved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. 
For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us from a sh- for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but rather it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And finally, that last question. What is to be our response? Well, first of all, if we take the Hebrews 12 text to heart, repentance seems like a a logical response. We should be asking the right questions. Why not me? Like Paul spoke of in that communion that was uh, practiced very selfish, uh, selfishly in 1 Corinthians 11, in verses 29 to 31. If they would just judge themselves, they would not be judged by God. Repentance should be a proper response if we take to heart the question, why me? Secondly, a proper response would be trust. Psalm 56, the first four verses. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I'll put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Thirdly, a proper response could be compassion and not judgment. The story Christ speaks of in John chapter 9 of the man born blind. The first verse he said, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Compassion's needed. Proverbs 24, 17 said, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Compassion, not judgment. A fourth response could be sorrow for others who are facing the trial or the suffering. Proverbs 17, 5 says, Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker, he who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Ecclesiastes 3, 4, to everything there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And then consider lastly, an appropriate response may be thanks. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I must not rejoice over the calamity of others and should detest the evil and the sins of men. In fact, Paul says in Romans 12, 9, Let love be genuine, abhor what's evil. But rather, in in whatever the circumstance, I am to embrace the promise of Romans 8, 28. That God is sovereign over everything and is using whatever happens for the good of his people and for his own glory. Can we be thankful in these circumstances? Absolutely, yes. 
as we look to see his purposes unfold and the good he has for his people, even in these days of isolation and disease. Let's pray. Your kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the purposes of which you bring us to a place where we cannot even gather. Our heart, obviously, is to be here. Some have already said they, they're missing the gathering. And that's good. Sometimes we take for granted your grace and your kindness. And that good alone may come from it that we have more of a passion for the gathering. Lord, may you be honored in our hearts that turn to you. We think of all those who are sick from this disease. We pray, Lord, for each of them, number one, that they might know Christ, your son, who heals the brokenhearted, who takes away the blindness from our eyes that we can see. We pray, Father, all these many thousands who apparently are dying from this disease, that they might yet hear the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. We would pray, Father, of course, for all that if it be your will that they be healed. That seems reasonable and just that we would ask that, but we only ask it according to and consistent with your will, your will and purposes. We might yet find that we ourselves, people from our own congregation, may come down with this illness. We would, of course, hope not, but it's, it's very possible. We would hope that none would be ill to the point of death, but that's not out of the question either. What's wonderful is that we know you, and we know that in all of this, you're doing it for our good and for your glory. And in the end, even if you take our life, we'll be with you in paradise. We'll be enjoying you forever. None of us would ever lose, but only as Job spoke, blessed. So Lord, we pray, Lord, of course, for the safety of our fellowship, the encouragement of our fellowship. Help us in the things that we're doing, even in this, this uh, service, that it might encourage our people. And we look forward to the day that we can once again regather and enjoy the sweet fellowship of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's close in a hymn. We've also added to the list of hymns one very familiar and always encouraging when we, we sing it. It is well with my soul.